Vodacom Super World Rugby Under 20 Championship. And just the eases into the shot. Doesn't overhit it at all.
Good afternoon. You're with ENCA.com and we are doing the ENCA live discussion. This week we're tackling the business of wildlife and we're looking at among some issues um, how safe it is and also the issue of canned hunting. Uh, today I have four guests with me but we're handling them in two different segments. Our first guest that we have is Vicky Brooker. Um, she's uh, known as an animal uh, wrangler. Some people refer to her as a lion tamer but she doesn't quite like that much. We also have Ainsley Hay here from the NSPCA and um, our red resident social media guru, Erin uh, Bates, is also here. She'll be looking at uh, some of the main things that people are talking about on social media. So we're hoping that it's going to be quite an interesting discussion and we hope that you stay with us uh, throughout the time that we're talking about this. I'm, I'm going to start with you, Vicky, and um, uh, maybe just off the bat, um, you deal with animals all the time. Can lions be, be tamed? No, absolutely not. You know, they can be conditioned to be tamer, and obviously if it's been hand-raised, they will be tamer, but they're only really workable with people that they know. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how good I would be with lions, if I went in with somebody else's lions, they would eat me. So they do what they do best, that's what they're equipped to do, and sadly, that is the case. Now, just last week, we had um, this uh, very tragic um, incident that happened at the Lion Park um, here in Johannesburg. It caught a lot of headlines internationally with people asking, you know, is, is that industry actually safe? Should there be better regulations? Um, I know that the, the NSPCA has looked at some of the regulations and commented quite regularly on what the Department of Environmental Affairs has proposed as to how um, lion parks and, and hunting should be handled. Um, in, in maybe you could tell me, with, with, with places like lion parks and places where people are, are driving through areas with wild animal, animals, what do you look for um, f as the NSPCA in terms of how the tra animals are treated or should be treated? Um, our concerns are quite extensive in terms of how all types of wild animals are kept in captivity. Um, one of our main concerns definitely is the captive lion industry throughout the country mm -hmm. um, because one of the biggest problems is that these are now wild animals that are being intensively farmed. Mm -hmm. So they're being kept in completely artificial situations, they're being manipulated by humans mm -hmm. and they're basically, um, there are a lot of very unethical practices that happen like um, forced removal of the cubs for interaction purposes. This mm -hmm. is commonplace throughout the industry. So the act um, that we enforce is the Animals Protection Act, which um, applies to even wild animals mm -hmm. as long as they're in captivity because they're under the control of a person. Mm -hmm. So incidences of cruelty that we find in these facilities range from things like parasitic infections, underweight animals, animals mm -hmm. that are starved because the owners run out of money because the business deal went wrong or something. Mm -hmm. Then you can have concerns with the way that the cubs are handled when they get older. We've had incidences of cubs being held by their tails and mm -hmm. beaten and that sort of thing. So there are a lot of unethical practices and unfortunately we will always judge an industry by its weakest members mm -hmm. and within the captive lion breeding industry we have shocking practices that are happening. Cool. Now I, I on your website there was a report that, that the NSPCA did I think in 2009 where it looked at, at, at the industry and some of the issues and, it, and, and those figures say that there were over a thousand uh, lion kill, killed, lions killed in South Africa in 2009. A huge increase from the 2006 figures for example but then at the same time we've got the Department of Environmental Affairs saying that um, there are only a few permits issued per province each year um, and I think the Department of Environmental Affairs uh, Minister said five per province so how do you how do you manage that I mean how did those figures don't seem to speak to one another it's a huge problem that we have and even anything from in terms of the reporting of what actually is going on to the permitting issues because one of the biggest problems that we have with wildlife is that you've got your Department of Environmental Affairs which is the national sort of body which makes rules and regulates certain activities especially with threatened species but then you've got each provincial Nature Conservation mm. Department and they have their own ordinances and their own rules and they issue their own permits but then the department issues other permits and mm. then you get p permits issued in contravention of DEA's permits. So it's, it's, it is a huge problem and the, the numbers that are being reported are not factual and it's not being adequately enforced, monitored or restricted at all. Maybe uh, you could also talk to us about this regulation issue. I mean, have you, have you looked at some of these issues and how the, the numbers perhaps conflict and, and how it's different standards in different provinces? I'm not really up to speed with things like that. I just know that where we are concerned, we have permits for all the animals and we are inspected by the, the, the NSPCA and mm -hmm. we are inspected by Nature Conservation. Um, we have all our permits in place. They are difficult to get and I'm mm. quite happy about that because what applies to us will apply to somebody else. So we're mm. very happy to 
to, to go within those regulations that we are, we are given. And um, I think they try and do a good job, but there is definitely a, 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 there is a, a hole in the law. So, so maybe you could just tell us what, what animals do you have and also how did, how did you end up getting those permits? Maybe you could just give us an idea of how the process actually works. Well, basically, we came from a, from a game capture industry many, many years ago, talking about 30-odd years ago, mm. and we were quite close to Johannesburg, so obviously we were, were easy to be, become a, f a film destination, and that's what we got involved with. And our animals were part of various consignments that we had had, where we'd taken animals off a drought area and relocated them somewhere, etc. and then obviously the, we might get one or two that had been injured or hurt, or a young that had been misplaced with its mother so that's how it started and then obviously it's always it's always been and we in the northwest province difficult to get the permit mm -hmm. we always get the permit if we need to get the permit and if it's it's just before us to have the permit mm -hmm. and we work on that all the time you know now our pens and the the farm gets inspected at least once or twice a year mm -hmm. and it is an ongoing thing and it, we've, we've missed film shoots because we do quite a bit of filming with our animals as well where the permits have not come through and we can't go we cannot take that chance because it's mm -hmm. basically our recommend you know our, our, our reputation that if we had to break those laws, we would uh, we'd have to suffer the consequences. And uh, are you finding that you're dealing like w w w what um, ANC said with a, di a lot of different departments, a lot of different legislations, and and struggling to actually f get a symbiosis between all of that? No, I don't think we are really in that in that that sort of a league. We have a, a relatively small farm with with animals that we've had there for quite a long time. They're all permitted animals, and we don't move animals around very much. So I wouldn't really be able to. Um, to be able to comment on that. I have heard that it is difficult and I have heard through the, through the grapevine that uh, this is happening, but we don't really have too much to do with it. Now this, this issue of the, of the Lion Park has been very controversial. Um, people have been asking questions about safety um, in places. I would like to say for our viewers who are watching that we did invite a representative from the Lion Park here, um, but they chose not to attend the discussion today. Um, but when you, you're dealing with a situation where you do have people entering an environment with wild animals, um, it, it's part of the tourism industry in South Africa. We've got people traveling from all over the world to see our wildlife. But there must be some kind of way to make it balance. And how do you make it safe for both the people and, and also safe for the animals? And perhaps you can both answer that one after the other. Well, you know, I'm actually quite surprised that actually there are not more incidents with regarding this. When you think something like the Land Park, which is open 365 days of the year, that has thousands of people a month coming through there, I think that they have the, the incidents and the accidents that they do have. And when I know what people are like and how people do not listen and how people will wind down a window, and mm. I'm amazed that there are not more. And I mean, that goes countrywide. You see open drive game vehicles going through areas where there are lions, wild lions there, which are different to, to lions that are more habituated. But it's interesting, it, it always amazes me, if I was to go on a game drive vehicle in a lion area, I would mm. make sure that I sat in the middle of the vehicle. And people laugh and they say, but you work with lions every day. That's why I'm sitting in the middle of the vehicle, mm. because I, I, I feel to know that, that, you know, know what they can do. And, you know, I'm always amazed that they're not more tax. That's very telling, just to come in from a social media perspective. The response we've had, Diane, on the story we initially published about the Lion Park attack, which ended so tragically, and then, you know, follow on stories about that. So much response, so much comment on going into a space where you have these wild animals, they're predators. Even now, there are 20 people on that article on enca.com. And what's also interesting is if you go to the Lion Park website, it says Gauteng, Gauteng's number one tourist destination destination, super close-up views guaranteed, mm. certificate of excellence. It really is a tourist attraction. It's a draw card for people yeah. who are in Kauteng who want to see that kind of, you know, African vista, the savannah, the wildcats. But at the same time, there are those risks involved. And, and that's some of the comment we've seen online. Mm -hmm. There are huge risks involved. You know, they really and truly are because you're going into three or four different fences. You're going through big gates. There's sign, signage all over the place. And mm. people still feel that they, they're more controlled, have a little selfie. And that's what lions do best. They sneak in, I'm sure, in a situation as sad as it is. Mm. With this, I'm sure the woman had wound down the window to take a photograph of some lions a couple of hundred meters away. Mm. Attention was drawn somewhere else, and a lioness came around the back. And obviously, that's what lions do. They're inquisitive, and they looked mm. inside. Mm. Once she had that panic and that body language of panic, it's instinct. You know, I mm. work out that lions are pretty much 80% instinct and 20% IQ. Yeah. So they're working off their own instinct. They don't, and people haven't gone there to be at a garden party. You know, they've gone to see the big, hairy, scary, and dangerous animals. 
I mean, you work with these animals quite often and you're going into these places where you are, are looking at their conditions, but it means you're quite close up with the animals quite often. Um, do you find that you have to remind yourself often how you should be behaving? Definitely not. They're, they're wild animals. Just because they're in captivity doesn't make them not wild. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with these facilities that allow people to interact with lions. So, for example, even at the lion park. So, visitors can go there and they can pay and they can play with a baby lion cub. Then they can pay and they can go for a walk with a sub-adult lion cub. Mm -hmm. So, nothing about any of that interaction has told you that it's a wild animal. Mm -hmm. It's told you that it's cute and it's cuddly and you can take a photo with it. Then, second to that, there's photos everywhere of the handlers holding the lions, rolling with the lions. It's it, the, the message that's given is that it is a very interactive type of facility. Mm. So it is members of public don't follow the rules. People don't follow signs. People don't follow speed signs when they're driving a car. So it is completely irresponsible for any facility that has any type of wild animal to let visitors have uncontrolled access. Mm. You cannot let them have the, have the be able to make a decision to roll down a window because they will and this is what will happen. Mm. This is the third incident that's happened at, at the Lion Park since the beginning of the year and the second incident where a lion has climbed into a vehicle's window. Mm. So this, this is not an isolated incident. This is not a surprise. We are not surprised that this happened. It's an absolute tragedy and it's absolutely preventable. Also, you know, these lions are habituated. They're fed from vehicles. Mm. They associate humans with feed. A lot of these lions have been hand raised. So they're, they're raised in a home environment and then they're stuck out in a camp with other lions. Mm. So they are very inquisitive. They're also a bit bored because they're possibly understimulated in captivity. So there's a whole load of factors that make it even more of a bad idea than if you drive into Kruger Park and you drive down a window and you roll down a window because wild lions, this is a completely abnormal behavior mm. unless you, you're into interfering with them or you're you know in between a cub and a mom or you you you're really annoying them you're not going to see this type of behavior in wild lions but captive lions it is expected so, yeah. sorry and, and 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 maybe you can come in with with um, some of the comments that people are, are, are giving about um, you know I don't know if any of the people that have been responding have been to the lion park and have said anything about their own experiences yes when when we published the initial story on on the attack we actually included some responses from people who visited the park mm. if I can just find one there was another man, uh, Brendan Smith, who, I don't know if you heard about him, shared, shared pictures on Facebook, and they're on our story at enca.com, mm -hmm. of uh, bite wounds from when he was at the Lion Park, and he was injured in an attack. And then we also had some tweets on other people's experiences of the Lion Park. One saying, for example, they complied with the rules and it was absolutely fine. If mm -hmm. I can just find for you, this person with the Twitter handle, Tuli and Tonga, said with, uh, oh, well, actually, this is uh, a different comment, but I'll include it. Uh, Tuli and Tonga says, with wind windows down, what exactly did they anticipate would happen? Exactly. Human beings mm -hmm. should stay far away from lion animals, uh, from wild animals. And then here's the one I was thinking of from Katlejo on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I was at the lion park some weeks ago, this was published on the 1st of June, and came out alive because the signs are very clear and we listened. And then uh, Katlejo has also included four pictures, one children very happily smiling with a very cute little mm -hmm. lion, mm -hmm. which speaks to what mm -hmm. you were saying about, mm -hmm. you know, kind of mm -hmm. sort of normalizing what you're actually doing mm -hmm. with a very dangerous animal. Mm -hmm. And then some other photos from the lion park but just to come in with a kind of devil's advocate argument mm. the difficulty here is that firstly the whole wildlife business the whole industry of private game parks lion parks all of that is a serious draw card for tourism mm -hmm. it also arguably adds to funds for wildlife projects and if we do away with these industries altogether are we not shooting the tourism industry in the that's, foot? That's debatable. There's a very interesting study that's actually just mm -hmm. been released that shows that 80% of all tourism income is through proper eco-tourism, bird watching, whale watching, safaris. Mm -hmm. And also the problem with your captive wildlife industry and facilities that keep wild animals in captivity for interaction display and that is that that money goes to them. Yeah. There's very little links of it going to bona fide conservation, even to mm -hmm. conserve that species in the wild. Because conservation of wild animals does not exclude conservation of the habitat. You cannot conserve a wild animal in captivity without conserving its wild habitat. So you've got to do the same. So to follow the money trail there, and unfortunately this argument is used time and time again, it's the same with the hunting industry, but there's a very interesting study that's just come out that actually says bird watching, whale watching, eco, proper ecotourism is actually funding more than these private profit-based enterprises. And one of the hugest problems that we have is that, you know, it's good to hear that you have difficulties obtaining permits, but it's bad because you may be one of the better operators because in other provinces anyone can literally pay and get a permit to open up a zoo. Pay and it's, a fee it's or pay a, is bribe. It? Pay a fee. 
okay. don't even have to pay a bribe because it's literally paperwork. It's, it's getting a permit. Now they have a permit to do what they want. Mm. And the problem is a lot of the provincial nature conservation laws, they don't have the power to revoke that permit. But then so they issue a permit. Isn't, isn't there then perhaps an argument for if, if, it's, if the industry is not necessarily going to go away in any way, and there's definitely a market for it. I mean, we can see it with the number of people coming to the Lion Park and other places. Um, isn't there then an argument that we need to have more regulation from a national level and it needs to be consistent? Without doubt. The problem is it's not, is it's not getting done. Mm. Our governmental bodies that are issuing the permits and that enforce the ordinances that allow these facilities to operate are not doing the work. It falls upon ourselves as a non-profit, non-governmentally funded, non-governmental organization mm. to go there. And then it's very difficult for us to prosecute on animal cruelty when it's permitted because the courts say, you say it's animal cruelty, but they've got a permit saying that they can do it. Mm -hmm. So the, the, pro the, the sole responsibility does fall on the, on the governmental organisations that are permitting these facilities, but they do nothing. I just want to come in there with some comment from Facebook, from our audience on Facebook. We posed the question, do you think private game parks are good for South African tourism or simply an animal cruelty? And mm -hmm. I have to say, the majority of responses we've received so far say animal cruelty. And maybe that then brings in that question of regulation, kind of applying for permits, issuing permits and then following up. Another difficulty if you look at social media and the immediate response to what happened to the, the poor American tourist in uh, in Joburg at the beginning of the month is that there was a lot of kind of lambasting. She was stupid, mm. she left the window open, she shouldn't have done this, she shouldn't have done that. And it's fairly callous because someone died and mm. her funeral is actually in the States tomorrow. But it also does raise that question of enforcing the rules in these environments. Mm -hmm. And where does that fall on the state or where does it fall on the private owner of a business? Interestingly enough, there's actually a law that speaks to that. It's called the Animal Matters Amendment Act. And it's mm -hmm. an act that's enforced by the, by the South African Police Service. And it speaks to um, if any person is attacked, injured or killed by any animal due to any person's negligence, that person can be held liable and prosecuted to the full extent. So the interesting thing is where, where does, so with, with this incident, instance, this poor lady actually did have a tour guide, an mm. independent tour guide in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So, Who you know, had a heart attack but does it go? Incident, yes, actually. does, you know, it would be very interesting to see in a court of law how far the negligence goes because if, you know, if the lion park already has had an incident before mm -hmm. where a lion has climbed in a window, yet they still, yes, they may have put up some signs, but is that really enough? Mm -hmm. And then also, where does it stop? Does it go to the provincial nature conservation that permits these activities? You know, we've told them that it's a really bad idea. We've mm -hmm. said that members of public are getting, have been, and will continue to get injured, but they're not doing anything to control or stop the activities. Mm -hmm. So are they then negligent? And if so, they would be liable for prosecution as well. So, so it seems like you're doing a lot of engagement with, with government. I mean, who are you speaking to? Are you speaking to, to, to the provincial government, Everyone national government? And, and, and you mentioned this legislation. Mm -hmm. Does it actually get enforced? Do the police know about it and are they acting on it? Not very much. Um, it's, it's not a very well-known act, um, but wherever we do hear incidences, we do try and get the message out there because also for families, you know, they're families that are affected mm -hmm. severely by this. And it's not going to change unless people realize that this actually isn't normal. This shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't pay to go somewhere for what you think is a lovely day out, but this is the problem. People don't think that it's wild animals. They just think that it's stuffed kittens and they're driving through and nothing's going to happen. So I really have to agree with you that mm. constantly we have quite a few visitors through mm. our park as well and we're constantly, constantly, we look like really big bad wolves trying to monitor something like mm. this. Mm. And people look at you and say, but why? Mm. Are they dangerous? So yes, that's why there's a big fence around them. Mm. And that's why you can't go in. And that's mm. why you've just walked through a barrier that says, please don't enter. They are dangerous. Mm. You know, and as much as fencing can protect to a certain degree, there again, this instinct thing I keep bringing in. Mm. Um, they can. I mean, instinctively, they, they can do the most predictable thing about a wild animal is unpredictable. <laughs> mm. And they can jump those fences, you know, mm. if, if forced to and for whatever reason. So it is. It's, and it's all the time. You're constantly being film crew, being even local people. But I mm. do find that the international people are a lot worse mm. than the, than the mm. local people. I yeah. wanted to just ask you before we go to our break, which I think is coming up kind of soon, how do you manage that with film crews? I mean, they're there to, to, to film a particular movie, so their purpose is not necessarily, they're not necessarily thinking about the wildlife, they're thinking about their film. So how do you make sure that in their process of thinking they're also considering how they should be acting towards the wild animals? You know, I'm particularly difficult and I see film crews roll their eyes when they see me walk on set because it is, it's all about safety for the animal, for the crew, for everybody to carry on. And you know, if you lose a crew member or a cast member, it's huge. And I mean, you just can't afford to do that. And then the animal is in question and I don't want any of the animals we film to be in question. So I really am, I'm not a nice person. 
when I come to farming with animals because I'm strict, I'm bossy, I've been called grumpy old ladies and whatever, but it's fine because ultimately they will get the best of the animal, the animal hopefully will enjoy it and they will make their movie. And that's exactly something that came up in, in the wake of what happened to the American guest. What's happened to the lion? Has the lion been put yeah. down? You know, and as far as we know, last I checked from, from what I've researched, mm -hmm. the lion was removed, so sort of secluded in an area of the park, but still still on the property and still part of the kind of consignment of animals. One tweet question, and maybe we can come back to that after the break. Yeah, we are gonna have to go to, bre to the break very, very soon. Very soon. So Paul Tully asks, where do all the lions go? Here we have the link to canned hunting, maybe something we can we can discuss when we come yeah. back. All right. Um, I think we'll be we'll be uh, going to to our break now. Uh, we'll be seeing a, a, an interview that was filmed um, earlier this year um, with with our, our colleagues at ENCA. Uh, it's an interview with the Department of, of Environmental Affairs, and there the minister is really discussing the issue of, of canned hunting and what the regulations are in terms of of the South African government and what their expectations are. Um, we we did touch on that now, uh, but it's something that we'll be looking at again after this short break. Canned lion hunting is banned in South Africa. We need to change guests. Actually, okay. to be precise, we have regulations that are called TOPS that's threatened or protected species. Mm. Now, what does a TOP regulation say? It says in regulation number 26 that shall not be in South Africa any hunting under the following circumstances under tranquilized situations, in enclosed uh, coverage, uh, hunting using a vehicle, following, in other words, the regulation 26 really talks to issues around that the lion must be free when hunting happens. It even mentions the, succumbs, uh, the, the, the uh, size of a, an area where hunting should happen. So that whole package of things actually tells you that we have prohibited canned lion hunting. The issue here, I think, becomes what is canned lion hunting? Yeah. The definition of canned lion hunting. There are those who believe that the breeders who breed in enclosed uh, 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 facilities, enclosed facilities, because there are those who are breeding. Remember, there are lions in the wild yeah. like in Kruger National Park those who are breeding within those facilities then that kind of breeding there are those who perceive that as canned lion but those who are breeding in those can small enclosed facilities do have to actually release those lions before they are hunted and we argued as the Department of Environmental Affairs that that kind of a release before hunting must happen it must be that a lion is released and left in the wild for 24 months. 24 months. 24 months. months. Yes. The court actually ruled against us. As I say, this is a complex matter. Mm -hmm. We took this matter and actually put in the regulations this 24 months. Those who are hunting took us to court, especially in the Northwest province. They won the case on the basis of the following technicality that you, Department of Environmental Affairs, you have nothing to do with animal welfare. But we really also must appreciate. The, those who are breeding in the country. Remember, they are breeding they're like, for this purpose. Not necessarily for this purpose, but breeding. Remember, they are not just, if you ha breed five, 25 lions per annum, and you are not going to be granted a permit, probably all other facilities may not have a permit to, to, to hunt in that particular year amongst the five or the 10 that's given. It therefore means that we have extra lions in our country, We're counting over 3,000 in the wild, by the way, let me put it that way that in the wild there's no threat mm. of the African lion in mm. particular. Mm. So the fight that's been brought mixes the issues. At times people say the African lion is under threat. There's no such a thing.
You're back with ENCA Live. We're talking about the business of wildlife and uh, we're getting into sort of one of the most contentious parts of this, the issue of canned hunting. Erin um, was just discussing or telling us about uh, a, a question that came from Twitter, was yes. it? Yeah. About this issue of canned hunting. So we had a question from Paul Tully who says, please ask the question, where do all the lions go? I imagine this is lions from private game parks and private lodges. Mm. Um, here, do we have a link or he's suggesting we have a link to canned hunting? And then in another tweet to us, he asks, is there such thing as canned hunting in South Africa? Okay. So we've got two uh, new guests with us for the second segment. Um, we've got Linda Park. She's from the campaign against canned hunting. And um, um, over here we also have Drew Abramson, um, a, a wildlife photographer. Perhaps, Linda, you could uh, deal with this issue of canned hunting. It's very contentious. Um, in the clip that just played, the Minister of Environmental Affairs says that there actually isn't any canned hunting in South Africa. But it seems like there's also a bit of an issue with the definition of what counts as canned hunting. Yes, you, you're quite right there. Um, I, don't, I don't want to cast dispersions on the minister and what she has to say, but canned hunting does exist. Um, the head of the Predator Breeders Association, we have on, on video um, with Carla Mann, who, who's very well known overseas um, wildlife investigator admitting that every single hunt is a canned hunt. Um, legally, in, in the legal definition, they don't mention the words canned hunting. Mm. So the minister is now saying there's captive breeding but there's not canned hunting. Mm. But captive breeding and canned hunting go together. Mm. Um, the reality is that you had the question what happens to all the, all the cubs. <coughs> um, there is no place for these cubs to go. So, so they are bred, they, they go through the cycle of um, being born, being taken from their mothers at about three, four days of age, hand reared, bottle fed so that they get used to humans. Then they go into the cub petting cycle, which doesn't last for very long. Some of them may go to walks um, and then they wait out their time until they're big enough to be shot. That's where they go. They cannot go into the wild. They can never be released into the wild because they have been habituated to humans. Mm. Um, and, and the reality is we don't have space in the wild for all these lions. Mm. So we have about 2,500 wild lions in South Africa. We've got 8,000 plus captive bred lions sitting in these facilities. Mm. They do get canned hunted. A canned hunt means it's a hunt, you're, you're assured of a kill. The hunt is in the can. And then these places will say to you, we don't do can hunting. No, they don't do can hunting. They sell the lions on. So the lion will go to the next door property, normally to the northwest, which is lawless in, in the extreme, and it will get canned hunted there mm -hmm. um, with hunters that um, probably couldn't walk on a hunt, so they come on a bucky or or whatever. It's a very cruel industry and yes, can hunting does exist at very much there. Well, one of the things that the, the minister mentioned in, in the clip that we played um, is that the, the regulations say that the, the animal shouldn't be tranquilized. Um, what they, one of the things they wanted to have is that the, the animal should be allowed to be roam free for a certain period of time, I think she said 24 months but that hasn't been formalized due to a court case. Um, and I think the other, the other uh, issue was that it shouldn't be in any kind of enclosure, rather um, sort of be running free. But what you're saying is that, in fact, the, 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 the lion or whichever animal isn't really free no. at any stage in its life. Yes, it's never free. It's not free from the day it's born. Mm. And um, when these hunts happen, uh, I had an interesting debate with, um, with the department at, towards the end of last year. I said, you guys issue the permits for a hunt, but do you actually go and see the hunt happening? Do you see mm. what's happening? No, we don't because we don't have to and we don't have the staff to, in, to, to go. So they say you mustn't drug the animal or you mustn't have it in a small enclosure, but there's no one there checking. Mm. We have videos of these hunts happening, where these lions are drugged, they haven't been fed for a week, they're put under a tree with a piece of meat, mm. and they're shot off the back of a bucky. It's a canned hunt. Mm. But there's a permit for a hunt, but nobody is there checking. 
you were talking earlier about the disparity with the figures. Yes, yes that's one, um, something I wanted we, you to touch we've on. We've had uh, very interesting um, information. The department will give you one lot of figures for exports. CITES will give you another lot of e figures, which are higher than the department. And China owned up to a far higher amount than mm. CITES and the department. And the reality is, if you're issuing a permit for a hunt, and you're not going to inspect that mm. hunt, there's nobody there from the department. Who's to say there's not 10, 20 lions being killed there? Mm. There's mm. nobody checking. And I think that's where these variations and figures come in, mm. because there is no enforcement, and that's the problem. You, you obviously will be commenting on the, on the um, I think they call it the top, top re regulations, yes, we have, which came out yes. in March. Um, maybe you could tell us, um, I know the regulations relate to, to endangered wildlife, but also could potentially cover these issues, um, such as canned hunting and what should be done. Am I, is my yes, understanding correct? Yes. So, so what are you calling for um, in relation to the canned hunting industry and perhaps in general the treatment of wildlife? Well, from, from the captive breeding um, setup, so we, we've been talking about the lion park. Mm. What we would like to see is that all breeding and petting of cubs and walking with these animals ceases immediately. Mm. Because it's not about conservation, um, it's not about the welfare of the animals, it's about making money. It's a huge money-making exercise until those animals get big enough to be hunted. Mm -hmm. um, so we would like to see all of that stopped. If the Lion Park, for instance, as we're talking about that, were there just as somewhere for the tourists to go and they went in Lion Park game drive vehicles, so we're not having tourists driving through there with their windows down, hanging out the windows. Yeah. There was a case a couple of years ago where there were Japanese tourists who actually got out their vehicle in the Lion Park mm -hmm. and one of the Japanese was eaten. Mm. So you will always have that issue where you just throw the camps open and say drive through and do your own thing and there's nobody there looking at you. So for, for us those issues, do away with the cup eating, do away with the walking with lions, stop breeding, have these facilities if you want where people can drive around but do it under supervised conditions. And the department must actually be taking more responsibility for what's going on. Mm -hmm. They're very quick to issue permits, but then they absolve themselves. They say, well, we've issued a permit, but these are no longer wild animals. Mm -hmm. They fall under livestock because they're being bred like livestock. Well, who looks after them at that point? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where we're falling down. Well, one could argue a wild animal is always a wild animal. Yes. yes. Um, I, I just wanted to bring you in here, Drew. You, you, um, a wildlife photographer, um, but you also you mentioned just before we started that you take um, people through, um, um, I suppose, on, on photographic journeys. Yeah. Perhaps you could explain how does that work? How do how do you make that work for you? It, it is a business, um, it and is. it has to be safe. Um, I have been involved in big cat conservation for quite a number of years, um, and I started the business because I realized that there was a need to, to get awareness out there and to educate the people with regards to the plight of big cats throughout Af Africa. And this, for me, was the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many international tourists coming to Africa and to South Africa um, to go on safari, um, take images of the big five, um, and they go home with their images, but I feel they need to go home a little bit more educated with, mm -hmm. than what they are. Um, so I, st I started the business about two, uh, two years ago, so it was quite recent, um, where we bring clients in, uh, they, they contact us obviously through the website, mm -hmm. um, and it's all done with, uh, within reserves, proper okay. wildlife reserves. There's no um, sort of, we don't support any facility that allows any interaction with, with any wild animal. And, and what, what kind of advice do you give to, to your clients, um, you know, when they're going into what is obviously a, a wild environment, but they want to, to get as close as possible um, to the animals that they want to photograph? Look, the people that um, I, we, we, we book through highly ethical um, lodges and uh, sort of game park owners and, and all the rest. So they are, are very aware of, of sort of how to deal with animals in the wild. Mm. Um, they, they can gauge body language. 
of the animal, the lion, the elephant, whatever it is that they come across. Um, before guests go out on drive, they are given a, a set of rules and regulations that they need to follow. Um, there's no standing up um, in the vehicle if they do come across an, a, a dangerous animal like a lion, a leopard, elephant, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and if any of the guests on the vehicle do break the rules, make a noise, stand up, um, they're not allowed to sort of is throw it, is things it an open off. vehicle? No, it's completely open. Okay. Completely open. Um, like Ainsley was saying earlier, that wild animals behave completely differently to captive. Mm. Um, your captive cats are, they, their fear for, for people has completely gone. Mm. Whereas your animals in the wild, in the, in, in the bush, they, they still have that respect for, for people. If you had to stand up in the vehicle for any reason, they nine times out of ten would actually turn around and run away mm -hmm. um, because you know you've sort of broken the shape of the vehicle okay. so the chances of that happening out in the bush within that open vehicle is very very slim perhaps Erin you could come in there yes. what are you hearing from uh, the people watching the discussion on social and um, are they are they asking us more questions we, we've had some response to what you were saying Vicky around canned hunting for example and some of the the issues of, of drugging the animals, um, other attacks, that sort of thing. Uh, more response, I have to say, in terms of the initial story about the American tourist. Mm. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about the comment on that is I've seen, for example, a discrepancy between some of the reports and the, the tweets describing the Lion Park as a safari um, space and some of the, the more regional articles and media which has described it as a park. So that discrepancy there between these are animals that have been trained and kind of taught mm -hmm. that they're living in captivity, they're reared from hand, they're still wild, but they've been reared in a certain way. And what you're talking about, which yeah. is when you're in the bush, you're on safari in some way like Kruger. Yeah. But even in the case of Kruger, I mean, the, uh, lions are big news at the moment. Mm. So there was news of a lion escaping through a, a hole in the yes, face yes. of Kruger, which we covered at ENCA.com. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and local kind of authorities saying, well, the concern is more around livestock than around actually attacking people. Mm. But I guess you never know. You mm. never know with the, with the wild. Well, what are people saying about, so. about canned hunting? I mean, do they have specific questions or are they just um, mostly we comments? Had, we had a follow-up question from uh, the gentleman who initially posed the question around canned hunting, Paul Tully, who I, th I think may be linked with the NSPCA. Um, he's, he's asked us if canned hunting exists and, uh, and he's also said that um, the Lion Park displays images on their websites with windows down promoting that this is kind of normalized behavior. So he's posed the question, which I think we've addressed and then also commented mm -hmm. on the Lion Park and, and the kind of access people have to the animals there. I'm um, sorry, just to touch on what you said now with regards to people, you know, the international networks saying that this happened on safari. Mm -hmm. um, it's two completely different things. That what this is, Lion Park is not a safari situation. Um, a safari is out in, in Kruger or the Sabi Sands or Botswana or Kenya or whatever the case may be. Um, and I think a lot of damage is being done to the legitimate safari industry with yeah. regards to stuff like this. So I just hope that that's possibly rectified yeah. a little bit. I mean, what's difficult also in the case of this American is that she had been on conservation volunteer mm -hmm. programs mm -hmm. or a program while she was in South Africa before she went to the Lion Park. So some interest there in conservation, some interest there in wildlife. And then, you know, the kind of, uh, to go back to social media comment, Diane, the, the barrage of kind of cruelty almost, you mm -hmm. know, and at the end of the day, someone's died mm -hmm. because they've been mauled mm -hmm. to death by a lion. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's, tragic regardless of the the kind of circumstances around that but I do want to ask if I may just mm. both of you um, with regards to the the industry the business of tourism and safaris and seeing wild animals how much is enough for for someone to get what they want I think about Donald Trump and his sons and these pictures mm. of these kind of like oafish mm. kind of visitors mm. over dead carcasses mm. of these beasts these wild dangerous animals if you have enough money can you get whichever pelt you want can you get whichever horn you want is that how absolutely. things run I think absolutely definitely mm. yes really if you have the money the sky's the limit and what kind of money are we are we talking about here millions mm. millions to hunt a, a normal tawny male um, is minimum three hundred and fifty thousand rand. 
And for a white male, I think it's up to a million. It's up to yeah. a million, yeah. So, so it's definitely a, a huge industry. Um, and I suppose that, that makes it almost impossible for it to disappear because where money is involved, it's, it's, mm. it's people always will have their own interests and their own alliances. So is there a middle ground somewhere um, where you can say, if, you are, if we are as a country, if we are saying that this is one of the things that we're going to do, this is how we should do it? Or is there no middle ground? Well, I think, I think before you even get to middle ground, you have to say the department needs to start stepping up their game. Mm. And they need to be not writing pages and pages and pages of, of supposed laws and regulations. Actually go out there, see what's happening, enforce these regulations. And where things like this, this is now the third incident at the Lion Park this year. Mm. Surely now somebody from the department should be going there and saying, mm. okay guys, you know, this is now not working. Mm -hmm. Because it's made, it, it's been headline news worldwide. Yeah. And it's made us look very bad. Mm. The whole captive breeding canned hunting industry makes South Africa look very bad. Overseas are always pushing and talking about it. Um, as you may, may or may not know, the Australian government um, had a lot to say about can hunting mm. um, and, and bless them, I mean they, they really stepped up the plate. So we, that whole industry makes South Africa look very bad in the eyes of the world mm. and, and for me that needs to be cleaned up. But, but and, and here's the thing though, what, what you mentioned is that there are a lot more lions in captivity than there mm. are in the wild mm. and these lions have all been kept in captivity so you can't just let them be free. No. What do you do with them then? If, you, if you're saying to a place like the Lion Park, um, actually we're not happy with the way that you operate or any other facility, what do you then do with the animals that are, are currently there? Why can't they turn it into a sanctuary situation? It's very easy to change things around mm -hmm. and it's very easy to re-educate people and and if you are able to explain to people exactly why you're doing what you're doing, um, if you were going to stop the cub petting and the line walks um, and say to the public, we, we have now made this decision to, to, tourists are still more than welcome to come, come through. We'll do guided, guided tours through the lion park, um, but there will not be any more interaction. Mm. Um, I think that they would get a lot more credibility for doing that because the issue of canned hunting and how inhumane it is, is becoming quite the hot topic, I think, mm. worldwide. Um, and un unacceptable. Mm. We have a question from Stephanie Blair on Twitter who says, does the government receive tax from the breeders and hunters? How, how if it is not monitored? So if, if canned hunting kind of happens mm. and there aren't officials on site or whatever, mm. how do they determine what to tax, how many animals have been killed, that kind of thing? Well, well that's you know? a very mm. interesting question and, and one I've raised quite a few times because human nature is what human nature is. And a lot of these hunts are um, signed off overseas. Money will be paid into an overseas and offshore account. Mm how much of that money does SARS ever see? Mm. Does mm. SARS actually know what's going on? Mm. They've seen one, a permit for one, one animal. We know the figures. So there's another 10, 15, maybe 20 that, that nobody knows about. And the money for that captive, particularly the, the, the captive hunts, but a lot with the, what you might call ethical hunting, the money's paid overseas. So is it declared? Mm. We know around the, the, the um, rhino poaching with the pseudo hunting and that, that those guys were all paid in piles of cash. Now that cash will never ever be declared. Yeah. So SARS is not getting um, any revenue. The country's certainly not getting any revenue from it. It's not supporting conservation mm. because that money is going to the private individuals. These hunts all happen on a private piece of land. Mm. It's not helping the communities around there. So there's a huge economic question mark over this, this whole industry as well. So this is a very interesting discussion and I think that uh, we're gonna have to wrap up very soon, but perhaps I can just get from you, Drew, um, just 
your sort of your final thoughts on 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 how um, as, as someone who works in in the industry in the tourism industry um, how things can be done differently and just sort of shortly just wrap up um, and what people should be looking for perhaps if they are coming to do a safari what what are the, the signs that they should be looking for that they're dealing with an ethical practitioner um, I think if people are coming out on safari they they if they're coming through Kauteng or Joburg, for example, they and en route to either Kruger or one of the private reserves, I don't think that th there is really that need, possibly there is, for them to go to um, a, a facility such as Lion Park to go and see captive animals when they're on their way to go and see wild animals. I don't know if it is the, the, the cub petting and the interaction that's drawing them into that situation, um, but I think as a rule, People just need to be aware that if there is any um, interaction that is being advertised, they should rather just stay away. Right. Um, because it, it's, it's just this, the whole cycle of the female uh, giving birth, the cub being taken, taken away after three, three days, um, then it's the interaction with the volunteers and with the public and then the walking and then the cycle just continues. Um, so, my advice is to, there, there are plenty ethical places that don't allow interaction where they can still see um, sort of sanctuary situation cats mm -hmm. and then they can move on to the reserve where they'll get to see the animals in the wild which is the best, best place to actually see them. Right. Um, I think that's that's our discussion for the day. Um, you know, a lot of information coming at us, and I think it's a discussion that will probably continue on social media, and that we'll probably have to continue as as a country about how we're viewing it, these things. Um, very important processes happening with the Department of Environmental Affairs. So I would encourage anyone who's interested to keep track um, with those developments and also to comment because you know we we all have that opportunity to voice our own opinions via that legislation of process thank you very much ladies thank for for coming thank through you. today um, you know and uh, and that's it for ENCA live thank you very much Erin for your your insight from Twitter and um, uh, that's it for today